I gave you guys the option if you guys want to answer any of those questions or give your guys feedback. If not, that's fine. So do you guys want to touch on that or you guys want to move on to this topic? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's move. I want to move on too. <laughs> so um, today we're talking about um, singleness and family. All right. So I put on top of, on top of that outline, um, although single people do not have a spouse to minister to and may not have children, um, singles can still be light and love their family members. We will look at Jesus Christ's teachings on family, and we will also study Miriam the prophetess to see an example of what to do and not to do when relating to family members. I know last week I, I said, um, you know, I asked you guys if you want, you could just Google Miriam Bible and just see what scriptures um, it touches on, because there's only like five or six scriptures on Miriam. There's not really a lot about her. And I forgot to mention, um, we're going to talk a little bit about Christ too regarding his view on family and how he um how he even ministered to his family as well um i know um before i mentioned this and i've and of course you guys know this that um spiritual family of the church is more important than biological family however um we don't not we don't just neglect our physical family you know unless if for some reason it's they they, they neglect you you know if they they have an issue with you because of your faith and they don't want you around okay that's you know, I understand that. However, um, if family still wants us around, if you're, um, you know, if you're still at the family gatherings and you're a Christian, you know, I, I encourage you to um, be, go to family gatherings and, um, you know, show an example of your life and, you know, share the gospel when necessary. Okay. So we're going to look at um, Christ's view of family first. So Jesus view on family. If you look at the first point, John um, chapter 19, verse 25 to 27. Now we're not going to go to each one of these points on Jesus' view on family because we kind of talked about that before and I do want to talk more about Miriam um, because I feel like um, she, she's like a person that we don't really study too much and um, I feel like you guys will benefit a lot from learning about her life as well. So John chapter 19 verse 25 to 27. Now this is when Jesus was on the cross. Um, let me see. John chapter 19 verse 25 to 27. So Christ is on the cross right now. Um, so if you go, I'm going to the second part of verse 25. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, which most likely that's John, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. So you see here, even though Jesus was dying on the cross, you know, bearing the um, father's wrath, he still cared for his mother. You know, he made sure that um, his mother Mary was taken care of. He, he um, you know, delegated um, Apostle John to take care of his mom. You know, so Jesus, he, um, you know, he cared for his mother. He honored, in a way, he honored his parents. Um, Jesus' relationship with his father, they don't really tell too much, but I assume that his father had a big role in his life because his father was a carpenter, and then Jesus was a carpenter. So perhaps um, his father taught, taught him about work, and Jesus was teachable on that. So um, that's an example of how Christ um, honored his parents and um, loved and cared for um, his family. And Jesus had a high view of marriage. Now, I know we talked about how Jesus Christ, in the first day of class, we talked about how Jesus had a high view of singleness. But he also had a high view of marriage as well. Um, in Matthew chapter 19, I'll read it, um, verse 1 to 9. And now, this, these were the, um, the religious leaders, the Pharisees. They were testing him regarding um, divorce and things like that. Uh, let me just skip down to verse 4. They were just testing him, asking him about you know, marriage and divorce. And Jesus, Jesus said in, in verse 4 in chapter 19, And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Whatever, What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Jesus is showing a high view of marriage. Not only that, he's actually confirming the book of Genesis. Why should we believe in, in, the, in the book of Genesis? That is real, because, well... It's inspired by God, but also we could say because Jesus did. Okay, Jesus affirmed um, a lot of the Old Testament narratives: the flood, okay, Adam and Eve, um, marriage. Did Jesus say something about homosexuality? Yeah, he did, right here. Okay, he said, um, you know, marriage is between a man 
and a woman. Now, Jesus also says something about homosexuality in the Old Testament. How? Because Jesus is part of the Godhead. If the Father says something, Jesus Christ said it too. The Holy Spirit said, said it too, so they're all one. Um, so if someone says, you know, oh, Jesus never said anything about homosexuality, you know, yes, he did. All right, so Jesus had a high view of marriage. That's what Matthew chapter 19 is about. Jesus taught that parents are to be honored. So if you skip down to, skip down to um, verse 19... Um, in chapter 19, once again, he's quoting scripture. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. All right, so he's quoting some of the um, Ten Commandments. This is when the rich young ruler, which we might get into later on uh, when we get into singleness and financial stewardship. Um, the rich young ruler, young man, rich, had it all like Lydia, except this brother was kind of selfish with his um, you know, finances and giving. Um, but you see here that Christ affirms that... Um, affirms honoring your parents and we saw how he honored mary too when he was on the cross as well um and even in verse 13 to 15 in chapter 19 that's the account when jesus blesses um, the children so christ loves marriage he loves children he loves parents he honors marriage he has a high view of marriage so you as a single person need to honor marriage and um, have a high view of it as well even if you don't want to be married Okay, Jesus obviously didn't get married, but you know, if if you feel like you know that's not your desire to be married and you want to um, you know glorify God and put more time into ministry, that's fine. However, you still need to have a healthy biblical and high view of marriage. All right. So, <laughs> point four. Does anyone want to say anything so far? Okay, just raise your hand if um, you want to say something. Point four. Jesus taught that the gospel. And following him, Christ is more important than physical family. So we talked about that already. Um, first class, and I think last class I mentioned that when we talked about the church. So I don't want to go into those scriptures right now. Um, spiritual family is more important than biological family. That's almost the same thing. However, um, that's just kind of emphasizing it more. So it's a balanced view, okay? Although spiritual family is more important than biological family still. You want to love your family. Um, you want to minister to them. You want to take care of them. You want to honor your parents, even if they, uh, even if they aren't believers. Okay, You still um, have to honor them as well. Um, so that's that for Christ. I know that was really fast. The reason why I did that is because Miriam, when I get into her, it's going to be a lot of stuff I'm going to talk about. So you guys have any questions or comments about Jesus Christ's view of um, family? Um, I, will, I will point to that um, John 19, verse 25 to 27, when he was on the cross and he made sure that his mother was taken care of before he um, left. Um, that's a, a scripture I would go to. I um, can't really think of another one right now. Of course, I'll have the ones, an, an example in the scriptures he quoted regarding honoring parents. I will put that there too. Um, let's see. I'm looking at the scriptures I have on this list. And I don't remember what it refers to. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, yeah, those are key scriptures um, I will put as well, too. But also, I will look at a lot of Old Testament examples, okay? Um, if you look in the Old Testament, a lot of the family members really care for each other, too. Um, when you think about, um, and of course, there's a lot of conflict between siblings, too, and things like that. However, um, it was a duty to really um, care for one another um, within the family. So yeah, I would go there. Remember when um, Cain killed um, Abel, you know, and then God asked him basically, you know, you know, where's your brother? And then Cain um, asked, "Am I my brother's keeper?" It's assumed that yes, you are. You are. To, you are to take care of your siblings. You are to love your siblings. You know, you're not supposed to, um, in a way, you are to protect and love. And and we're we're going to get into that with Miriam too, by the way. Okay. So I can't really think of a specific example of Christ, um, like in a way loving his siblings in scripture obviously he did if you look at john chapter 7 verse 5 you'll see that um, his brothers neglected him um let me see john chapter 7 verse 5 i'll read it real quick uh, 
for not even his brothers were believing in him. So Jesus said to them, my time is not yet here, but your time is always opportune. Um, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that the deeds are evil. evil. Go up to the feast yourselves. I do not go up to this feast because my time has not yet come. Okay, so <laughs> I guess we could say this based on what we just read, okay? Although <coughs> Jesus' siblings didn't believe he was the Messiah, later, later on James um, believed, and, and Jude, those were his, his, um, his own brothers, and they wrote the, some of the New Testament. Uh, we could say that, okay, there are going to be times where family members are going to have an issue with our faith, and we can't force that on them. However, we, we could minister to them, like how Jesus said, there's always an opportune time if you want to talk about this, if you want to talk about the gospel, if you want to repent and turn from your sins and, and believe in that, okay? That's fine. Um, I think pretty much all of us here have family like that who are very um, opposing and antagonistic towards the gospel. I do. I have a lot of family members, whether um, they're just atheists or if they're a nation of Islam or, you know, black Hebrew Israelite, whatever, okay? And, you know, sometimes... Um, there's a sense to where we probably have to cut them off if they're causing us to sin, if they're, very, if they're being very antagonistic. When you think about Psalm 1, you know, you don't want to sit with a scoffer. You don't want to be associated with a mocker. So there is a time where you have to not cash your pearls to pigs. Remember when um, Christ was just quiet um, with Pilate because at that point he knew that he's just antagonistic. He's just an enemy of the gospel. He's very um, stubborn of the heart, has a hardened heart. So then, and in, in that case, you know, it's case by case, but if that's the case, uh, we may have to um, just go our separate ways in that case. All right? Um, that's why Christ said, you know, if you, don't, if you don't love me more than family and hate your mother, father, and all that stuff, um, that's, that's an example of that. You know, we have to prioritize the gospel and Christ before family. The world teaches that family is everything. No, it's not. <laughs> you know, Christ is. Family is important. You know, God has a divine purpose as to why you're born into a particular family, at a particular place, at a particular time, a particular culture, a particular ethnicity. Um, however, um, the gospel supersedes and transcends above all those things, all right? But that's an excellent point. I hope I answered your question. That was very long. Sorry about that. <laughs> you did, yeah. Okay, excellent. So you guys ready to hear about Miriam? Want to move on to that? Okay, so Miriam, what, how I'm, I'm going to teach this, um, the, primary, the primary scripture we're going to go to is number chapter 12, um, so you can just turn there now, but let me just give you some background information about Miriam in case if you don't know who that, who that is. Once again, excuse me, if you want to get um, some notes on the background notes from me, uh, just text me or email me and I'll send it to you, okay? So number chapter 12. So, who is Miriam? First of all, she's the daughter of Amran, that's the father, and Jochebed, that's the mother. And you can read that in Exodus chapter 6, verse 20. If you read that, it's something interesting, and we're not going to talk about it, all right? <laughs> okay. Older sister, Miriam is the older sister of Moses and Aaron. Aaron was three years older than Moses. However, we don't know how much older Miriam was um, to Aaron and Moses. However, we could assume that she was a lot older than Moses when Moses was born because remember, she's the one that was watching him in the river making sure he, um, he was safe. So I would assume, like, you know, what do you guys think a young, how, how responsible could someone be at that age to do that? Like 12 or something? <laughs> About maybe seven, maybe six or seven? It depends. Yeah, some kids are very mature. So uh, <laughs> eight for sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so we know Aaron is three years older than Moses. We, we read that scripture, um, but we don't know how old um, Miriam was. But she's a girl. That's what the scripture says. Um, Miriam was a prophetess, um, a praise worshiper through instruments, singing, and dancing. We see that in Exodus. Along with her brother, she, had, she led the Israelites in the Exodus and in the wilderness. Um, Micah chapter 6, verse 4 mentions how Moses, Aaron, and Miriam led the Israelites. So in some capacity, in some way, Miriam led the Israelites. Now, maybe it was just a woman primarily. Um, we don't really necessarily know. Um, the scripture talks a lot about Moses, talks a lot about Aaron, but Miriam, not, not so much. But it is clear that she had an important role. Miriam died in the wilderness. You can read that in Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Like the rest of the generation of Israelites, because of their lack, and, lack of faith and complaining, she was not allowed to enter the promised land as well. 
uh, when she died, there was not any water for the Israelites, which caused them to complain against Moses and Aaron. Jewish tradition connects her death with the Israelites having inadequate water. Tradition believes that Miriam blessed the Israelites in the, in the wilderness with water. So if you read Numbers chapter 20, verse 1, you'll see that Miriam died. Then the following verse in Numbers 20, verse 2, um, you'll see that the Israelites started complaining because they had no water. They're complaining against Moses and Aaron. So a lot of Jewish people... Jewish tradition believes that somehow Miriam's presence um, blessed the Israelites with water. Okay, now I don't know if that's... I, I don't really lean towards that because it's not in the Bible. That's my view. However, um, that's just a tradition that Jews had that I found pretty interesting. Okay, here's another interesting thing about Miriam that's outside the Bible that we don't really know, but it's speculation. Outside sources in the Bible claims that she was married to her. Her, um, H-U-R, he was also the leader of the Israelites and close friend of Moses and Aaron. So if you guys remember who that is, remember when Moses um, was on like a big old cliff or a mountain or something like that, the Israelites were all fighting, and every time Moses' hands were down, um, the Israelites were losing, but then Aaron and Hur, Hur was the other guy that, that, that helped lift his hands up, the Israelites were winning, that's who, who that is. And scripture says that he was a leader too. We don't really, it doesn't really say much about him either, um, but he was a leader. So for example... Ancient Jewish historian Josephus, who's a very um, credible historian in Jewish history, if you guys ever never heard of him, look him up. He even has a lot of evidence for um, Christ's crucifixion, um, his impact, and everything like that, because he was, he was around during that time. Okay, so um, Josephus claimed that Miriam married a man named Hur, but this cannot be substantiated with scripture. So here's my view. Because of the Bible's silence on Miriam's relationship to her, as well as, as well as silence on her relationship status in general, I take the view that she was single, okay? It's interesting to me how, um, you know, they mentioned Moses, Aaron, you know, being married, having kids, but with Miriam, um, they don't. So that's my view, okay? Now, if you have a different view, let's do like Phoebe. Let's just pretend, okay, she was single, all right? <laughs> And even if she wasn't single, we could still learn a lot of principles um, with her life, all right? All right, so Numbers chapter 12. I'm going to read that whole chapter. This is a very good chapter. Um, this is actually one of my favorite chapters. I actually have a sermon on this I, I thought about preaching one time here, but maybe, Lord willing, I could preach it some other time. Um, so there's a lot going on in this in this scripture, in this chapter. However, uh, I'm not going to touch on some of the other key aspects you guys might have questions on. Uh, I'm just going to, let's just focus on Miriam primarily, okay? And I'm still going to read the whole chapter. Numbers chapter 12, verse 1. Then Miriam and, and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, You three, come out to the tent of meeting. So the three of them came out. And then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent, and he called Aaron and Miriam. When they had both come forward, he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, openly and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? So the anger of the Lord burned against them, and he departed. But when a cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous as white as snow. As Aaron turned toward Miriam, behold, she was leprous. Then Aaron said to Moses, O oh, my Lord, I beg you, do not account this sin to us in which we have acted foolishly and in which we have sinned. O oh, do not let her be like one dread whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes from his mother's womb. Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, O oh, God, heal her, I pray. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut up for seven days outside the camp, and afterwards she may be received again. So Miriam was shut up outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until, until Miriam was received again. Afterward, however, the people moved out from Hazroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Okay, so we see here, 
remember, let me just remind you guys, okay, Miriam is an amazing woman of God, okay? She's an exemplary woman of God. She's a prophetess. She was a leader. However, just like any man of God, just like any woman of God, she has some flaws, okay? She had a sinful nature, and we see um, account of this here, okay? So here in Numbers, we see that Miriam was causing family dissension with Moses, Miriam was envious of Moses. She was gossiping, complaining to Aaron, to Aaron about Moses, causing Aaron to take sides with her. By the way, here's a character flaw about Aaron that it seems like. It seems like Aaron was a pretty passive person, very um, influenced or a people person in a way. That seemed like a flaw that he had because remember the golden calf situation? <laughs> and, he, and when Moses came down, he asked, hey, what's going on? Aaron, what happened? And Aaron's like, oh, I don't know. They, they wanted to worship a god. I just threw the jewelry in there, and the, the golden calf just came out. You know, So Aaron, sometimes he was very spineless, and you could see that he was probably afraid of his sister. Remember, she's the oldest one. Uh, maybe she was kind of domineering and stuff, and Aaron was just um, being passive in that sense, all right? Um, now, Miriam verbally attacked Moses' wife. Now, the root of this opposition was because she's jealous of Moses because um, the re- I guess the relationship he, um, he had with God, maybe because he's a leader. Um, you know what's interesting in Numbers chapter 11, um, you know, God came down to the Israelites and got on them for complaining. And Moses was being tired. He complained to God, and then God um, told him to take, you know, some elders to help you guys to help you out. And now we come here to Miriam complaining. Okay, still, <laughs> but this time it's about not about you know quail and and, and manna. It's more about um, Moses, I guess, position or role as a prophet. Now remember, Miriam was a prophet prophetess. Aaron was a prophet. So why were they complaining? Um, most likely because of Moses' unique relationship with God. Okay, um, it is disputed as to why Miriam had an issue with Moses' wife. Um, most commentators believe the issue was because of racism, because um, the scripture emphasizes how Moses' wife was a Cushite, or some translation says Ethiopian. Um, doesn't necessarily mean she's from the country of Ethiopia, like I would say in our days. It just means that she was a black woman. Okay, she was African Nubian woman. Um, if Miriam's criticism of Moses was based on racism, it is ironic that God punished Miriam with a skin disease, um, a white-colored form of leprosy. Um, some commentators believe, basically, you know, God probably was like, okay, you getting on her for her skin color, I'm going to jack your skin color up or your disease up even worse, okay? Um, and back then, dark skin was very valued during that time because, you know, who was ruling the world during that time? It was Egyptians. And um, perhaps Miriam was probably wondering why you with this black woman. You know, black woman and black people enslaved us when we were in Egypt. You know, why are you being like, like a sellout? Sounds similar, doesn't it? Just <laughs> reversed. Um, maybe Miriam was like that. That could be um, a possibility. Also, I forgot. I need to mention this too. Um, this is probably Moses' second wife. It's highly um, believable that Moses remarried because um, they mentioned another wife earlier on in Exodus named Zipporah. You know, Jethro's daughter. And then um, it doesn't record her death or anything. It doesn't record a divorce. I highly don't believe Moses got divorced because, um, you know, he's a leader. If it was a divorce, it probably wasn't his fault. <laughs> but I, I believe that Zipporah um, probably died. And then somewhere along the line, um, Moses got remarried to this particular woman, this black woman. Um, and I believe that too, because why is Miriam tripping all of a sudden? Okay, mm-hmm. like you know, it's forty years. <laughs> if if that's the case, um, Moses was married to this woman for forty years. If he wasn't remarried, so um, Miriam probably just maybe just being an overprotective sister and just concerned about Moses. Who who knows? Um, so sometimes it, some people believe that it was a criticism because he's married a second time or something. I believe that it is racially motivated because the scripture in verse 1, you see, because of the Cushite woman who, had, who he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman, the scripture is really emphasizing her ethnicity. So I do believe that Miriam was um, being racist. <laughs> now, can, can, can Christians, you know, struggle or be racist? Yeah. <laughs> you know, they shouldn't be. But there are people, in scripture you see that Jonah was a racist. Um, Peter struggled with racism, racism and um, Paul had to check him. In, in, Gal- in Galatians, you can read about that. Um, it's, a, it's like a sin that, you know, the church or Christians don't want to talk about or no one wants to admit that they're struggling with it. <laughs> but it's out there. I mean, someone's struggling with it. Um, 
So yeah, that's, that's another flaw that Miriam possibly had, okay? So regardless of Miriam's motivation for having an issue with Moses' wife, she was wrong. And it is clear that the root of her issue of Moses' wife was grounded in her jealousy of Moses. So when you're envious, when you're jealous, okay, sometimes other sin will be exposed and produced from that. Um, so yeah, one of the results of envy is that it will manifest other sins and pollute the heart even more. So there are many plausible reasons to believe that Miriam was the initiator of this family friction. Um, first reason is that Miriam is mentioned first. I mean, that's probably the most obvious. It says, then Miriam and Aaron. Second reason is that Miriam is the one who receives a harsher rebuke and discipline from God than Aaron. Um, it's interesting how only Miriam is um, plagued with the leprosy and not Aaron. Um, also, her sin was to be remembered in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 9. Her sin was an example of what not to do for the Israelites. So um, in Deuteronomy... Um, you know, Moses is giving instruction to the Israelites before he passes away, and then Joshua takes over and stuff like that. And one of the one of the um, advice that Moses gives, I mean, of course, it's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he said, you know, remember Miriam's sin. Don't be like that. You know, don't cause friction in the camp. Don't be a meddler, a gossiper, you know, just a, a busybody. Um, don't be like that, because that's going to cause a lot of friction. Um, another example, so this is going to sound very technical, all right, so, but follow me, okay? In Numbers chapter 12, verse 1, the Hebrew verbal form of the word to speak, it is in the feminine, feminine form, okay? In Hebrew, usually the verb matches the person, gender, and number of the closest noun. In this case, the verb to speak is closest to Miriam. That's the noun. So the literal translation should be, then she spoke Miriam and Aaron against Moses. Of course, in our language, that doesn't make sense. It sounds clunky, but that's the literal translation. So... I highly believe that Miriam was the key um, initiator of this problem, okay? Um, so we see, um, if you look, go back to your outline of, on Miriam, in, in point four and five, we see Miriam negatively influenced her brother Aaron, which is a negative example of being um, a godly person in the family. And point five, Miriam was jealous of her brother Moses. Um, and you read that in Numbers. So those were her bad attributes. Of course, I don't think she was always like that. Um, however, I think it's recorded in Scripture for our um, benefit to learn from those mistakes to not do them. Okay, so as a single person, um, you know, you don't want to be a negative person. In fact, you no, know, just with anyone. You don't want to be involved in other people's marriage trying to start stuff like that, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, you got to be careful, okay? It's okay to, you know, you know, of course, be involved in, in your family's, you know, like let's say if you have a brother or sister and, you know, they're married and things like that. Um, however, you don't want to cause disruption or disturbance or anything like that, all right? You got to be um, very careful with that because, um, like I said, you need to have a high view of marriage as well. You need to honor marriage, and you don't want to um, be a negative influence. So, you know, Miriam, she was probably a racist, you know, jealous of um, Moses because of her stance. Maybe she was mad because she couldn't, uh, she's not married, she don't have no man, so now she's going to be in her brother's business. Who knows what the, what she was thinking, okay? But the, the point is that she was causing a lot of friction and problems. Those are the bad examples of um, the bad aspects of Miriam. But let's look at the good examples that she had, okay? So, like I said, woman is a, Miriam is a, an amazing woman of God. Let's look at an example. Point one, Miriam showed an example of honoring her parents. So, Exodus chapter 2. Back, before we leave Numbers, does anyone have questions on that? On Numbers 12 or anything like that? What do, why do you guys think that Miriam was... Um, do you guys think that it was like racially motivated with what... Um, yeah, it seems pretty clear in Scripture, right? Yeah. So, to me it does too, but you know, people debate about that. All right, so Exodus chapter 2, verse 1 to 8. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got him a wicker basket and covered it over with tar and pitch. Then she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to find out what would happen to him. 
the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the Nile, and her maidens walking alongside the Nile, and she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid, and she brought it to her. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the boy was crying, and she had pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Uh, she knew that because he was circumcised. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew woman that you may nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go ahead. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Um, then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take the child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. The child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she named him Moses and said, Because I drew him out of the water. So we see here, so of course Miriam's not grown here. Okay, She's a girl. You said she's 12. You said she's 8. You know, how old did you say she was here? Somewhere in that area. Okay. <laughs> Someone said six. Who said six? You said six, Mr. Parker? <laughs> okay. <laughs> hey, so do you think do you think a six-year-old could do that? No. How, how, how old? Because you have kids, too. How, how old do you think? I think 12. I would say 11. Probably between 10 and 12. Yeah. It depends if it's a boy or a girl, too. You know, like a, a 12-year-old boy probably can't do that, but a, a, a girl could, right? No, an eight-year-old girl could do this. Not an eight-year-old boy. <laughs> yeah. It's so, a very mature thing to do. Right. That's why I was like six years old. I don't know if they would have the maturity to like yeah. specifically go and get her mom. Like right. ask that question and then right. go get her mom and yeah. while, while being discreet about it. Right. They complain and stuff. They try and finish their <laughs> video game or something like that. You know, yeah. so. I mean, that was her baby brother. Yeah. She knew that was her brother. That was her that baby too. brother. So she cared about him. Excellent point, because that's the second point. Mir- Miriam showed an example of, of loving siblings by loving Moses. You know, so Miriam loved Moses, despite the issue of Numbers 12. I'm sh- even sure she still loved him after that mm-hmm. whole issue, okay? But Miriam loved Moses. If it wasn't for Miriam's role right here, oh, wh- where would Moses be, right? Mm-hmm. Now, of course, God is in control of everything, but God used Miriam in this, in this sense here as a young girl. Um, to do this brave deed of, you know, making sure uh, Moses was okay and even talking to the, um, you know, Pharaoh, the daughter of Pharaoh. You know, this is a um, high-class woman. This is, everybody know um, the daughter of Pharaoh. You know, that's like, you know, Kardashians or something like that. You know, I don't know if it was like that, but it's the daughter of Pharaoh. And she went up and talked to her. And, um, yeah, like you guys stated, this is a very mature girl, so she was probably... If she was young, she was pretty wise, bold, and very mature. Yeah. So Miriam showed an example of honoring her parents, you know. She, and she wasn't being like a little jealous right, right here. She wasn't jealous, okay. Mm-hmm. She wasn't like, oh, man, that's a little baby. She, he, you know, he's going to have more attention than me and things like that. And remember, Aaron was already born already. Aaron was like three years old during this time. So she, um, she was on the lookout for her brother. She loved her family. She loved her mother, okay. Um, Miriam, point three, Miriam showed an example of worshiping the Lord. Now, I know this has nothing to do necessarily with family, but I really want to just show you guys how amazing Miriam um, was. You know, Miriam is one of my favorite women in in the Bible, okay? So I just want to um, point this out. So this is right when um, the Exodus, when they crossed the Red Sea, and Moses, and he has his long song and stuff like that. You know, he spit a few bars, and then Miriam came on, all right? She came on with her sisters in verse 20. Miriam, the prophetess Aaron's sister, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out after her with timbrels, with dancing. Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exhausted. The horse and his rider he has hurled into the sea. Okay, and she ended the song right there, okay? Um, and if you know... If you know hip hop, usually the last person who's spitting is the best one. All right, no, just kidding. so we see here she and she's leading the woman in, in dancing and singing and, and instruments and things like that. You know, so this is a if if you want to argue that praise dancing is biblical, you could use this as a reference. Okay. Um, also, what else did I want to say about this? So Miriam is a prophetess. There's oh yeah, there's a praise dance right there. She, she's trying to hide. Okay, and like, yeah, I forgot. This, this shows scripture right here, huh? So, um, although Miriam is a prophetess, it doesn't really say many prophecies in the Bible. This is like one example. Remember, prophesying isn't always telling the future. Sometimes it's just proclaiming um, God's inspired word, okay? So, remember, everything that, pro- that a prophet said is not recorded in Scripture. Remember, we study Anna the prophetess. Um, what did she tell the people? You know, what did she prophesy about? Um, perhaps it was just maybe about the Messiah, maybe just to comfort people. Uh, we don't know. So 
don't think that, oh, she's a prophetess, but she doesn't have her own book of the Bible or anything like that. Um, so some way, she was a leader. If you read Micah chapter 6, verse 4, Miriam is up there with Moses and Aaron as being prophets leading the Israelites. Okay, so I just want to sh- put that out there. In fact, how could, how could this relate to um, being single in the fam- family? Do people know you as a, as a worshiper? Do people know you as, as, a, as, a pra- as, as a praiser? Do people know you as a serious woman or man of God? You know, you got to think about that. Do people see you as, as a Miriam, that you honor your parents, that you really love your siblings, you look out for your siblings, you'll, you'll stand up for your siblings, all right? So those are some things that you need to look at too. Um, so that's it for Miriam. I want to get into the um, questions now. I'm going to find because that's wrong. It's 10 o'clock exactly? No, it's 11. Oh, okay. Great. Let's get into the um, discussions, all right? Or does anyone else want to say anything about Miriam? Aaron. Question number one. Christ had unbelieving family members, and we read that in John chapter 7. Um, how do you handle unbelieving family members? You guys have any stories, or, any, or is everybody in your family safe? Yeah. <laughs> this is hard for me. Uh, like I told you guys, man. Like, I mean, the majority of my family they aren't safe, so it's um, it's hard. And I I really ask these questions because I really want to learn from you guys. There's no right or wrong answer. I don't have an answer for myself necessarily for every question. Like, I'm genuinely answering this. So just pretend that I don't know and you answer and minister to me. Okay, so how do you handle unbelieving family members? You certainly pray for them. Yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. oh, wow. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. So, Daria? Um, building, building trust by, like, spending time with them, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, that's, that's the best part. Mm-hmm. Also, there was, um, someone, yeah, I made like a little, a personalized gospel track mm-hmm. just to the family member mm. yeah. after a tragic event happened mm-hmm. and told the family member about the event mm-hmm. and said, hey, I really want to bring this up. You know, this happened. I had made this for you. You know, what do you think? Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah, I remember I wrote, well, it was an assignment for the seminary in my evangelism class, but I think it was a pretty good idea where we were required to um, write three letters to unbelieving people um, that's in our lives. They could be friends or family. And I remember I wrote two of them to a family member, one to a cousin, one to um, one of my aunts, because they're, um, they're not believers. Um, they're still not believers. However, I, I like that assignment because it made me I mean, sending a letter means a lot, <laughs> even though it's old school, but it really shows that you really put in time and effort. I mean, that's why I love letters, I guess, are such a big deal, but you're putting in a lot of time and effort, and you're thinking and considering, and also, you know, personalizing it, and um, yeah, so, Mia? I would just say, like, it's really hard when it's family, mm-hmm. um, because, like, you really love them, and you want them to you know, know the truth, and sometimes you can expose them to the truth and share it to the truth in the face, mm-hmm. and their heart is so hardened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so you kind of got to walk along this line of exposing them, but then relying on the Lord to mm-hmm. open their heart. So yeah. then, right. knowing that you have no control over it, and still loving them, and still trying to be an encouragement to them, and then also not... Um, because I know in my experience sometimes when it's consistent exposure, they can become even resistant to you, mm-hmm. knowing that that's all you care. So then, like, loving them, like, in a way where you're not always, like, trying to attach scripture to everything to make them yeah. feel, um, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. But I know mm-hmm. that sometimes they can be turned off when it's like, oh, everything's about God with right. you. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's hard because it's like you want everything to be about God because you want them to see, like, this is the truth. Like, it's hard to think about yeah. your family members going to hell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think that that's what I find to be the hardest thing is, like, wanting so badly to kind of force the scripture in their head, but then also having right. to trust the Lord that in his time, mm-hmm. yeah. prayerfully, mm-hmm. like, that he would open up their hearts. Mm-hmm. That's good. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, and I think Mia made a good point. Um we can't force salvation on them, mm-hmm. but because they're our family members, we have a special affection and love to mm-hmm. them, yeah. and we don't want them to go to hell, so we want to force yeah. mm-hmm. salvation. We want, like, you have to be saved at this time, but the truth is we have no 
control over that. It's really in the Lord's hands. It's up mm-hmm. to Him who He saves. But yeah. He hears our prayers and like Stephen said, praying for them. Mm-hmm. But I think it's patience and love and prayer mm-hmm. that you have to yeah. do with your family. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And that may be that you just care about what they're going through and you're not trying to dump a Bible at them. Mm-hmm. Right. You know. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it takes the Lord to yeah. do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. to me, I mean, I feel like families are the hardest people to minister and evangelize to, at least <clears throat> in my dis- in my experience. So, awesome. Show that your uh, your Christian character. Mm-hmm. You, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like there there are like sides in the family. There's an argument, and this person's on this side, and that person's on. You know, don't don't try to take sides. Yeah. And, and, and be like Miriam, you know. Yeah, and uh, draw more division. Yeah, you know, e- even though the Lord said He said He He, he didn't bring a, you know He brings a sword, mm-hmm. so there's going to be a yeah. division. But we want to be peacemakers, <clears throat> right? You know, as, as, as much as possible, right? Because because there's always going to be dispute. Yeah, especially when it comes to a funeral. Well, they wanted it this way. Well, I want to do it this way. So oh yeah, there, there goes a big fallout. There. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's true. Funerals, um, funerals, and and weddings. <laughs> those are um, those always bring conflict when it's really supposed to bring families together. But for some reason, um, and I think it's a really a satanic attack. Really, um, right. Satan he probably uses that to infiltrate and cause conflict for no reason. So, so but a lot of times, the family members who are not believers mm-hmm. are going to keep an extra eye on us. Right. Right yes. in a camcorder. Yep. Yeah, I remember you. you yeah. Know, you got up there cursing <laughs> yep. <everybody out. laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And you call yourself a Christian. Yeah. And you got up there and got drunk after you. <laughs> yeah. You know, that brings up another point, too. Like, I think it was in the scripture where it's like, it's hard to be a prophet in your own town. Maybe yeah. Christ, Christ, like Christ experienced that. Yeah. Christ and Jeremiah. Remember, we yeah. talked about yeah. I'm like, I feel yeah. like it was biblical. But that is not biblical, right. yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's hard too when you have family that knew you before you were saved, mm-hmm. and it's like oh, you're trying right. to profess Christ, right. and like, right. and they're like, "But I know what you be doing, and I yeah. know what you used to doing. How are you gonna tell me when you used to?" You know? Right. So that could also be challenging as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I experienced that, or even um, older family members. They saw you when you were little. They saw you know when you came out the womb, you had a diaper, you barely walk in, and then you're trying to you. you you, uh, you're an adult now and you're trying to minister they don't take you serious sometimes you know um, so that's another point too great point all right uh, second question as a single how do you view marriage do you honor marriage um, if your view is negative why is that the case to have a healthier and biblical view of marriage you may want to read and study the following and i have a whole bunch of scriptures um, hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says that marriage is to be in, in honor among all people um, I'll just read that. I know we always go there to talk about how the marriage bed is undefiled and fornicators and adulterers will um, be judged. However, um, this is a key point. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled for fornicators and adulterers God will judge. So let's focus on that point, okay? Marriage is to be held in honor among all. And in First Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, um, you know, there are people who are forbidding marriage because they thought it was, um, they're not, you're not as godly if you do um, get married. It says, men who forbid marriage and advocate, abs- advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. For it is sanctified by means of the word of God and prayer. So, of course, in this context, there are people teaching that certain foods you, you should abstain from. Marriage is to be abstained from. Marriage is to be avoided. Mar- marriage is to be looked down upon. Mm-hmm. Remember, you know, if you want to be single, you know, that's fine as long as you want to use that singleness to glorify God. You know, not for sinful purposes. However, even if you, if you don't want to get married, you still need to have a high view of marriage and honor it. Because God created it. It's a blessing and it's a beautiful thing and if you if you're single and you want to get uh, married um, that's important too you know you need to have a healthy balanced view of both marriage and singleness because if you have a negative view of marriage and then um, you know you're trying to try and get married it's going to be harder for you okay now I understand maybe some of us grew up with in a broken household where you've seen maybe abuse or you've seen um, you know your parents divorce separated divorce and 
Uh, maybe you, had a, you have a bad experience with men and you're a woman. Maybe you're a man and you had a bad experience with a um, woman um, in the past. Um, I understand those aspects. Um, however, we must um, really, you know, pray to God and ask him to heal us of our baggage and have a very um, godly view of, of marriage or man, female, whatever. Okay, so do you guys want to answer that? Or if not, that's more of a personal question, something that, I mean, I wrestle with as a single person. I, I'll tell you guys that. I didn't always have a healthy view of marriage um, or even of woman, too. Um, but just, you know, just wrestle with that on your own if you guys don't want to share, okay? Um, so question number three. This is probably something else you might not want to share. I'll share this, too. And, I, and I'm aware that um, it might be easier for me to share some things because I'm, I'm married now. Okay, but, but still, um, you know, go ahead and share if you guys want. So number three, as a single, how do you handle attending weddings? Do you find yourself having a hard time at weddings because of jealousy that you are not married? When you see people around you getting married, does it cause you to become discontent with your status as a single? Um, what are some ways you can practice being content in Christ? Now, I remember um, I was at a church, and there, everybody's getting married. You know, so it was, it was kind of like here, you know. Last summer, like there was like a plethora of, of marriages, like three or four or whatever. Um, but I remember I experienced that. It's like, man, everybody getting married, you know, left and right, you know. And it caused me to actually be jealous sometimes. I think, like, man, how how is this person getting married? Or he's younger than me. He's like, you know, he's 20 years old. She's 18, and they already getting married. Like, what about me? And, and I'm ser- I'm a youth pastor, by the way. And I'm serving and stuff. I'm doing things for the church and all that stuff. But I'm not getting married or anything like that. And it caused me to be discontent and jealous. Mm-hmm. And um, I think um, that might be something that I don't know if a lot of other single people struggle with that. I never really talked about that with anyone, actually. But it is something that um, I experienced. And it's going to be hard. See, this is an example of when it was hard for me to really honor marriage because I'm being negative about it. But then... Um, I still had to learn and wrestle with being content in Christ. And we talked about this before, being content in Christ, because wherever you're at, whether you're single or married or have kids, you get a degree, you get a job, there's always going to be something else that you want, <laughs> you know? So you always got to keep that in mind. So do you guys want to share anything about that or no? I don't mind sharing. Uh, be go. Um, and let me, let me, let me, let me, yeah. Yeah, uh, growing up as a, I told it like the young people before, even when I was saying this, Yeah. And so, like, and I, when we used to go to church, like, we used to see, there was a season, there was a lot of wedding people, and they were Christians, but they'd get married, but then they would be divorced, like, a mm-hmm. following year, right. or whatever it was, the last day. <coughs> mm-hmm. So, like, it was kind of discouraging, like, how are you getting married, mm-hmm. but then you're divorced in less than a year when you're supposed to be, like, <laughs> wow. like, yeah. like right. I, I mean, obviously, it's God, you know, I take that part, like, you have to, as part of the group. Right. And I remember, like, the time my parents were, had an argument and they had a div- and they wanted to divorce each other mm-hmm. at that time and it was just like and it was like the Lord put it was like like I always thought of that scripture so like I take that seriously like it's like definitely mm-hmm. part of like God takes marriage seriously mm-hmm. he does not like divorce at all right mm-hmm. and so it's like I always and I remember they were going to that time and I gave them that scripture I was like look I was like either I remember I said I was, I was like so cause my mom was like well me and your dad stepped out of arguing so we're gonna get divorced and I said it joking about saying, so like, well, that means one of you guys is dying because, you know, God is not like divorce. Mm-hmm. So it means to be one of you is dying and healed. Yeah. Or, you know, and so, and it's just like, and that kind of, you know, but then it's like coming to Fairview and seeing all weddings, like, mm-hmm. here was like the first time I actually saw like an actual quick, like, when I got invited to like seeing Jonathan and Shaquille were married and Matt and stuff, like, those weddings and even your weddings, like, those were like, real Christian weddings and like those were like even though I grew up in Christian like those were the first times I've ever actually seen those so like I appreciate it more mm. from that set yeah like, that's awesome mm-hmm. Janice well a lot of people know my view already so somebody else wants to talk well I think you're the only one who had okay. your <laughs> or Sansar oh well I mean yeah I could say yes to all of these things the mm-hmm. jealousy the discontent all of those yes yeah. I've been mad at all of that yeah um, so yes to all of those, and, and I don't say it to be proud, I'm just being honest. Yeah. Um, but I think that um, that happens mm-hmm. when you have that unhealthy view mm-hmm. of marriage, like when you feel like 
And another unhealthy view could be, oh, God wants to bless them more than me. Mm. He wow. cares more about their happiness mm-hmm. than mine. Yeah. You know, so I think just the key <clears throat> is having the right view of marriage. Because mm. I've even had women preaching to me, you know, oh, you should think about not having children. And, mm. you know, I've just had a lot of things right. come at me. Like, oh, well, maybe it's not for you. to be. Yeah. Just all kinds of things. And I think you have to get back to what the Bible said mm. and what how God is leading you. Uh-huh. Um, and um, what are some ways you can practice being content in Christ? I think being honest with him and spending time with him mm-hmm. because he can heal you of all that. Right. And make you happy in him, mm-hmm. which is what he's done for me. Yeah. You know, so, um, yeah. Thanks for sharing, Janice. Thanks for your transparency, too. Mm-hmm. Sansaria? Oh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry, I had a little frog in my throat. Um, yeah, no, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I just, I'm not kind of numb. I'm mm-hmm. just like, oh, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. And then... No, I don't feel anything. Mm. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a problem or not. <laughs> uh-huh. It's like, oh, good. Like, I'm happy right. you know, for them or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I'm just like, okay, life is going. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of concerned. <laughs> <laughs> like, why you feel that type of way? Is it because yeah. it's like, oh, it's nothing new? or? No, it... I just, um, you know, I never grew up in a married household. Mm-hmm. So, I yeah. guess for me, I, I, I feel like why like do i want to be married or do i not want to be married i'm very confused about that sort of thing and and i don't know why i'm confused about it and so mm-hmm. like if i'm at a wedding it's like oh that's good that's wonderful and then, then i just i don't feel <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. yeah well thanks for sharing that so uh-huh. sorry yeah. yep Victoria? i think it depends on you know that person if they strongly want to get married Mm-hmm. And they see someone else getting married, then of course they're gonna be like jealous. Like, mm-hmm. just like I want that. Yeah. You know? Like why don't I have that? Mm-hmm. Um, and you know that I've, I've experienced that. I think I, I mean you think that you're not you're alone in that yeah. situation. Uh, you could probably ask a lot of singles mm-hmm. who strongly desire to get married. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because that's the difference. Like with mm-hmm. you, since sorry, I don't know if that's as much of a strong desire. But if you have a strong desire, then of course mm-hmm. you're like, man, like yeah. where am I? You know what's mm-hmm. happening? Right. Um. So I think I think that's the key. But um, with the contentment, that I mean, that that's what it really comes down to, and it'll help. I like, guess something that I'm still like struggling with and working on is just like being content in Christ mm-hmm. and not strongly desiring like anything. Like yeah. that shouldn't be the case. It shouldn't be over mm-hmm. something. So that's where it lies the problem. Like if you're becoming jealous right. or discontent, like it's clearly a heart problem. But you're like, yeah. well. You're not content with what I've already given you. Like, what's the problem? You yeah. know, so Thanks for I think sharing. that's the big thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I would say, well, I mean, everybody knows kind of my views. Like, I struggle with with marriage. Like, I have a very unhealthy, negative view about mm-hmm. marriage. Um, but when I think about people getting married, especially depending on my relationship with the person that's getting married, mm-hmm. I struggle with how the relationship is going to change. Mm. Um, I struggle with, it's like my own selfishness and mm-hmm. like, oh, that person's not going to be as available. Mm-hmm. Or now I have to worry about like, oh, they're going to have this guy or mm-hmm. if it's the guy that, I, that I'm friends with. Like, mm-hmm. oh, now I have to like yeah. think about how that's going to look different now that he has a wife. Yeah. Um, and so I know for me, like that's some of the things that go on in my mind when yeah. people get married. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I remember in the book we're reading, he even shared those same concerns. Like, man, like some of the friends I have when I get married, it's relationship is going to be a lot different with them, you know. So, and that is one of, like one of the hardships of singleness we talked about too, you know. I think it's not so much about just being married, but marrying the right person. Mm-hmm. You know, the, yeah. the person who's going to put the effort in to making it a good uh, uh, marriage. Uh, There was a book that uh, a preacher wrote, he says, good marriages take time, bad bad marriages take more time. So it's not so much (laughs) just, I'm married. You know, do you marry the right person? Are you you getting the right counseling, you know, before going into marriage? Mm -hmm. When you're getting the right counseling, you know what to expect. Mm -hmm. You know know. know that the enemy is going to be throwing things at you. Yeah. You know, and how how are you going to, you know, what's your overall game plan with that person and that person with you? Mm -hmm. But if it's just getting married just to be married, Mm then that's, that's trouble. Yeah. Brother Parker? Well, to talk about 
top it all off, uh, marrying the right person, it's a godsend. Mm -hmm. If you wait on him, wait on it, he will send you somebody that is perfect for you. Mm -hmm. Nobody's perfect, but you will have your trials and tribulations. Mm -hmm. But if I sent that person to you, it's meant to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been through a lot, I've had a lot, but nobody is perfect. But the one I have now, she's perfect in every aspect of a marriage. You mm -hmm. look at, I look at her and it's it's like God said. Mm -hmm. The way we met, the way we are with each other, yeah. it's like he sent her to me. Mm -hmm. All I did, I said, I'm not getting married no more. This is, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. I ain't doing it. Mm -hmm. I waited on it. I was in a place I wasn't supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And he sent her to me. Mm -hmm. Now it's like, it's, it's one person. Amen. You have the same look. Be the same person. You mm -hmm. see one, you see both. Yeah. I couldn't do what I do without her. Mm -hmm. We are one of a kind. I Amen. Mean, it's everything described in the Bible. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, a perfect marriage will happen. You just have to wait on it. Mm -hmm. And Amen. I look on that and it's like... It's 22, 23 years. Mm. Uh, not perfect, mm -hmm. but she is me. I mean, Amen. If you take my rib, that's her. Amen. It's perfect. I couldn't do without it. Mm -hmm. Amen. And just you speaking, I think another good point, too, for single people to have a healthier view of marriage, you know, be around godly couples like that so you can hear advice like that. You know what I mean? Don't think that you just hang out with singles. You know, try and hang out with, um, you know, whether young or, or older, older, older couples, a, divi a diverse um, amount of couples so because you don't want to think that oh your marriage has to be just like that particular couple it's always good to hear a diverse amount of different testimonies regarding marriage too so that's a good point which we'll talk about later with Priscilla and Aquila yeah that was good so I know we run out of time so the last two questions let me just we'll talk about it either in the beginning of class or you can just do it on your own time so number four how do you handle parental pressures concerning mar marriage either being pressures on getting married or pressures to not get married yet do you struggle with pleasing your parents versus doing what you think God wants you to do? Of course, married people will struggle with that too. Um, verse 5, I mean, <laughs> you guys laughing at that. Huh? I said, no, I don't struggle. <laughs> Question 5, in this sinful world, family conflict is inevitable. We see sibling rivalries all throughout Scripture, from Cain and Abel, you know, all down the line, so the one we read today. So when Moses was antagonized by his brother and sister, he still prayed for his sister when she was disciplined by God. Aaron also repented to Moses. Are you quick to forgive when family members offend you like Moses? When you do sin towards family, are you quick to repent like Aaron? When family conflict arises, use that opportunity to show the love of Christ. Be compassionate, forgiving, meek, and gentle. Okay, so we just talk about that next week, or you can do it on your own time, all right? So thank you so much for your transparency. So this is why this class is very, um, in my eyes, successful, because you guys mentioned a lot of good things, okay? So next week, we're going to talk about um, being single and friendship. So we're going to look at um, an overview of Paul's companions. I might look at Jesus Christ's friends, too, um, but I might just stick with Paul, because... Um, you know, I think he has like more friends on the, in the scripture, okay? Also in Proverbs, look at what it says about friends too, and we'll talk about that. Also read chapter 3, singleness, singleness means no intimacy in the book. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this um, time. Thank you for your word that could really help, have us, help us have a balanced view on uh, marriage and singleness and how we are to um, be involved and be light in our family, Lord. Just pray for uh, everyone's family here. Pray that they're, they're able to be light. Pray that when conflict um, does arrive, that they'll be peacemakers and gentle and meek and that they'll be quick to forgive and really be compassionate and show the love of Christ, Lord. And just pray for all of our contentment, whether we're single or married. We all need to practice being content and remember that you're the only thing that will fully satisfy us and be eternally minded. Just understand that heaven is what we <coughs> await for. Nothing here on earth will replace um, what you do for us and what you will um, do for us um, when you um, glorify us in heaven. Um, and Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.